Hello and welcome to the third and last session of our workshop series Simulation for Makers. Yes, again, I'm very happy to see so many participants here in the session. And since this is today our last session of this workshop, we will today make a lot of wrap-ups and, and also today I want to show you a complete new type of, of uh, simulation which we will perform together. But I think you guys should already know the procedure. Uh, First of all, I would like just to make sure that everybody can hear me loud and clearly. Uh, so please, there is this raise your hand button, and in the case you can hear me, please press this button. Okay, I can already see some hands, great. In the case, uh, I don't know for some reason, your audio quality should, should become bad during this webinar, you can also use our um, toll-free audio service numbers, which will directly connect you to the audio of this webinar. Just dial one of these toll-free numbers and enter this access code. Great, then let's dive into it. And our today's session is about cooling simulation. So we will investigate a cooling flow through an electronic housing. And um, first of all, you will get a very quick and hands-on introduction to heat transfer, which is the main, uh, let's say, uh, physical phenomena which is underlying this cooling processes. And after this quick introduction, I will give you a live demonstration how to set up such a cooling simulation yourself. We will take a look at the results and then I will show you the last and final homework as well as the question and answers. Um, just one general thing, uh, you may notice that last week we had some technical issues, therefore the submission deadline for uh, the homework of session 2 was extended uh, till Sunday. So in the case you were not able to finish your homework so far, you have still some, some, some time remaining to finish it and to qualify for our free professional training. Yes, uh, about the webinar. I will make it very crisp, but again, we have some people who are joining the session the first time. So basically, the idea of this workshop series is to give you a hands-on introduction to engineering simulation uh, with the aim to, to really to make you able in the future to use SimScale and engineering simulation for your own projects. Um, and since we really want to make it very hands-on, we cannot focus so much on theory and other stuff. In the case you're interested in this, I would suggest you to, to consult one of uh, one a book. There are a lot of good books about engineering simulation theory, and for sure when you qualify for our professional training, uh, you will also learn there a lot about theory and fundamentals. Okay, great then. Yes, uh, maybe just, just again to, 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 to point it out, um, this uh, workshop uh, comes with homework assignments and I really uh, recommend you to finish all these homework assignments since they will not only help you to, to uh, gain additional knowledge, they will also qualify you for training. Okay, then let's directly dive in into our today's topic and start to talk about heat transfer. Um, maybe just for me to have some background information, you, maybe you can press the raise your hand button in the case you already have some, some knowledge about heat transfer. Oh, so it seems that at least two, two or three guys already, uh, oh, four or five people already uh, uh, know a lot of things about heat transfer. You can, if uh, I, uh, I think most of you learned it at university, right? And therefore, let me just give for the other participants a quick introduction to heat transfer. And for sure, if you have a question, you can also ask. And first of all, what is heat transfer? As the name says, heat transfer describes processes where heat is transferred from one to another body of fluid. And basically, there are three types of, or three, um, Yes, types of heat transfer. Uh, the first one is called conduction, and just imagine you have like a, a block, a block from metal, and one side is very hot because I don't know there is a fire on the left side or another heat heat source, and uh, that's the reason why T1, so the temperature on the left side, is higher than temperature on the right side, and if you wait some time. 
also the right side will become warmer and warmer and the reason for this is so-called conduction. This is a very basic uh, uh, phenomena in heat transfer and just means that heat, and this is by the way a general region, uh, heat is only transferred from a hotter to a colder re region. And in this case we have a, a heat flow called Q which is transferring heat energy from the left to the right side. And this is really a, a fundamental mechanism for heat transfer conduction. We will later on also take a look at some examples. And compared to this, convection can be much more complex. We're talking about convection when the heat is not transferred directly by, by uh, uh, or through a solid. We're talking about convection when heat is transferred with a fluid. And in this case, just imagine, you have a heated plate and a flow which is flowing, or air stream which is flowing over this plate. And let's assume that this um, air stream, the fluid, has again a lower temperature than the plate. What will happen then is that we will have a heat transfer from the plate uh, to the fluid, and not only to the fluid, but through the fluid. So the fluid is transporting the heat itself. There are two different mechanisms for, for convection, but in the end, what you have to keep in mind is conduction means heat transfer through a solid, while convection is, is, is referring to heat transfer through a, a, a fluid, and not only through a fluid, but through a fluid by its motion. So we are transporting uh, mass and heat at the same time, so convection comes every case convection comes also with mass transfer. And the last and to be honest not so important for, for us mechanism of heat transfer is radiation and radiation is something completely different. Uh, so um, you can compare it a little bit to, to other kinds of electromagnetic waves like light. Um, you don't need any, any mass or anything to transfer transfer heat through radiation. So you need no solid or no fluid because it's also working in the vacuum. And radiation in the end has this, again the same principle just with one difference. Here you cannot say that it's transferred from a heated to a colder region. Um, in the end everybody independent from its environment temperature is uh, transferring heat via radiation. Okay, guys, if you have a question, because I know that's quite hard stuff we're dealing with today, just write a question in the question box and I will try to answer it as soon as possible. Okay, and now maybe uh, since we have talked a little bit about this mechanism, let's try to find examples. And uh, I think left is a very easy example. Here you can see just a pot on a heat plate. And here we have a very good example for conduction because the heat from the, this, this plate is transferred through the solid of the pot. And this is, by the way, what we'll see later is on this, you cannot really um, reduce a physical phenomena like heating up of a pot only to, to one of these mechanisms. But the main mechanism here for sure is conduction. Another good example is, convection, is, is, is this uh, hair dryer here. Here we're talking about convection because the heat energy is transferred with the mass flow of the air which is leaving uh, the hair dryer here at the outlet. And a very good example for radiation is the sun or stars in general because as you know, there is a vacuum in space, so there is no possibility for convection or conduction um, it's only transferred by radiation. Okay, and then maybe just one very important thing, and this is I think the main message you should, should take from this, let's say, a little physical course. In the end, and this is a question you have to ask yourself every time you want to, to do this engineering simulation, you have to model your problem. And as I mentioned, there are three different types of mechanisms for heat transfer. And I would say, in, in the real world, I think all of the three types are usually involved. If we just take 
go look back here on our part. For sure, 99.99999% of the heat is transferred through contact uh, by conduction. But we also have radiation. We cannot see it, but it's there because everybody is is emitting heat radiation. And we even have a little bit of conduction here where the water is beginning to boil because then we have hot steam which is transferring the heat and this is convection. And I think that's really the message. Uh, in most of the cases, the three are not equal important. And for example, for our first example, the, the main mechanism is conduction. For the second example, the hydrides was convection. And so the general challenge is to identify the primary mechanisms of your heat transfer and to simplify it as much as possible. Because that is the only chance you have to get a very good and fast simulation result. Um, yes, and here again I think you can see the overview and really please keep this in mind. And now a very important point. Um, the SimScale platform is a general simulation platform, but right now our solver for heat transfer do not support radiation. The reason is quite easy for most of only fluid flow phenomena. Radiation is not important. And it's the same for conduction. You can consider conduction, but then you need to couple a, 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 a structural simulation and a fluid flow simulation. But if you only want to I want to do a fluid flow simulation, you can only uh, model convection. And by the way, for cooling and HVAC, convection is the main mechanism of heat transfer. And there are just, and that's I think the last, let's see, let's say the last slide about our little physics course. And there are two kinds of convection. And this is also very important when we are going to think about how to cool uh, a housing. First of all, the so-called forced convection. Just imagine you have the heat sink or several heat sinks like on a, a processor unit and then you have a fan. And this fan is now pushing the air around the heat sink. What will happen now is that, and just imagine again, our air should be colder than uh, uh, the heat sinks. We have heat transfer through this um, horizontal flow and this is so-called forced convection because we are forcing the air to move above the heat sink and then it's taking heat uh, uh, taking heat energy and transfer it by, conve by convection. Another example, just imagine you have no radiator and some of you may know that modern laptops, most of them do not have a radi uh, not radiator, sorry, do not have a um, radiator was the wrong word. Do not have an umbrella or a fan. For sure this is a fan, not a And how is that working? That is so-called natural convection. It means just imagine you have no fan here. But still, if we would assume is at static the flow field, heat would be transferred from this heat sink to the air. And then the air heats up. And where when air heats up, density gets down and then it's rising up and then it's a kind of natural convection effect and then the motion of air is not forced by external fan but by the change of density of the air. Okay guys, I hope you get a crisp introduction into this. If you have any questions related to the really fundamental physics, uh, you can write them to the questions, but in general, this demo was more to open your eyes a little bit and to show you what is a step from becoming a simulation consumer to a simulation maker. And this abstraction process is very important. And right now, we will apply our knowledge on a simulation. And first of all, what, we would, what will we do today? Um, as, uh, as we mentioned in, in the announcement of this workshop, Today we will um, try to improve the cooling of a Raspberry Pi. And just as a quick introduction, Raspberry Pi is a quite um, I think famous, you can say famous, uh, open source hardware project. 
and it's about creating a very very small computer which can be used for different applications you can use it as a microcomputer and install Linux on it you can also use it as a control unit for 3D print and so on and so on and some people are using it for example as a media center uh, or to upgrade the TV to a smart TV since it's very small consuming low energy and uh, it's able to install Linux on it and a lot of people because this, this Raspberry Pi is shipped without any housing or case want to design their own housing and then we come to the problem because if you make your housing too small and if you also have too much slot in your Raspberry it, become, become, it can become too hot and so therefore our idea today is to, to um, compare two different designs for, um, for this housing and then to judge which one is better and first of all before we can do such a simulation we strictly need some boundary conditions and in this case we need the surface temperature for the simulation and here's a very good example how you can get boundary conditions if you really have no idea about your problem what we did we just took a Raspberry Pi and used the iRED camera and so we were able to get information about the temperature distribution on this Raspberry Pi microcomputer. There are two important things you should consider. First of all, um, you have to make sure that there is no convection if, during this process. So what we did is we looked for a room which is uh, where there's no wind. Then we uh, um, connected uh, the Raspberry Pi to power and waited until the temperature field gets static. For sure, this is not a 100% correct boundary condition, but it's a good, I would say it's a good first try, which will help us a lot. And just for you to understand what we will do right now, we will simulate the flow through such a casing of the Raspberry Pi. And first of all, we have a CAT model of the housing and also a CAD model of the Raspberry Pi itself and since we're doing a flow simulation this time we are not interested what's happening inside the uh, in inside the case itself but we're interested what's happening inside the flow domain which is bounded by this case and which is this one here on the right side so the first step is to um, isolate this inner volume and simplify it so that we have a good starting point for our mesh. And again, it's we're doing this time a fluid flow simulation, but it's again the same process. We have to create a mesh while pre-processing, set up the simulation, and then we can take a look at the 3D results and try to get insights. Okay, and then I would suggest let's directly swap to our live demonstration and here you can see the cat model and you will get a project link later on in the tutorial which contains two cat models uh, and these are two different designs for this housing one is so a so-called passive design which is based on natural convection so we have inside uh, slots here outlet slots there and the idea is that air, the air inside get heated by the electronics rises up and this creates a kind of, 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 of a low pressure which is forcing new air to enter this or new fresh cold air to enter this housing from the side and another, con another concept is to use a passive active version with a fan where you have here a fan here the slots and right now we want to just to first of all create a simulation of this passive version so the first thing we have to do is to create a mesh and again the mesh is here also needed because we have to tell some scale of the computer exactly where we want to calculate pressure temperature etc and for this we need the mesh so it's the same procedure first of all we'll create a new mesh and select this passive geometry as our base and then you can see it's added here to our meshing tree and you can also check directly the bounding box length so if you have some scaling problems you can see it here about this values make sense okay and now we can add the mesh operation again it's quite easy we can use again automatic 
uh, mesh algorithm and we will use hex auto dominant automatic for internal flow. And so very important, this kind of mesh can only be used for CFD simulations, while set readable meshing can be used for both CFD and structural simulation. And again, we just have to define two parameters. The first parameter is the fineness. We will choose three moderate. And then we have to choose the number of computing cores. 16 should be fine. And there is an additional field here, a list which is called surface with layers. And this is a very important point. So please let's just take a quick look on layers, what they basically mean. And let me just open my drawing tool. Okay. Right. Um, just imagine you have We have this plate here. And then you have flow coming from here. And what a lot of people basically don't know is that um, the flow here is attaching to the wall. It has a kind of sticking con boundary condition. And if you would take a deeper look here and would say you would have a kind of, let's say, velocity profile. And when entering this plate, this profile will look, just one second, sorry guys, this profile will look like this. And this here is um, your y, and this here is your velocity u. So the velocity here on this point on the surface is zero because the air is there sticking to the surface. And then we have a kind of flow profile here. And this flow profile is very important because it's going to change, and you have a very, very big change in y direction regarding your flow velocity. And now when we're going to mesh it, just imagine you would use a kind of uniform mesh. In this case, that would mean, let's use red, if you would use like two processors, uh, two cells, dis uh, discretize this. it would mean that you just have two points here and here. And if you have two points, the representation will become very bad because then it's looking like this. And on the other hand, the change of velocity in this direction here is very small. And therefore, there's a trick to use this dedicated, a special kind of elements which are very flat and looking like this. And then you have growing cell height. And that allows you to resolve the, the big gradient of velocity in y direction very good without using too many elements. And that's what we're doing right now. A very important point is you can should apply this layers on all surfaces. Expect inlets and outlets because on an inlet or an outlet the flow direction is normal to the surface. There is no boundary layer. So we will right now, so on this surfaces here we will have no boundary layer and therefore we don't need any layer elements. And now you can select on which faces you want to apply these layers and just a trick, instead of selecting all the other surface, I just select the ones I don't want to select actually, and then I use this invert selection, add select from viewer, and then everything is added properly. Right. And now that's it, and we can start our meshing job just by clicking here on Start. Great, then. It's time for a little bit wrap up. 
So I just showed you first of all what you should already know how to open a project and then we talked about meshing and uh, which kind of meshing technologies are available. We decided to use automatic meshing with Snappy X Mesh for Internal Flow which means that we only have to specify a global parameter for mesh fineness, the number of computing cores, and on which surfaces you want to have layer elements and everything is calculated then automatically. For sure you can also set up the mesh manually but in this case automatic meshing should be fine. And there are like every time some issues we cannot cannot really talk about a lot today. First of all this cat cleaning this model is quite nice. It's closed, it's a solid body and does not contain small features or edges and this is something which you have to do in any case in your CAD system before exporting the model to some scale and as I mentioned uh, you could theoretically also set up this mesh manually. Great. Guys, if you have questions just, just drop them in the chat window by the way. And yes, now you can see our computing job is in progress and since it will still take some time I've prepared for sure the project the same settings which is already computed and now you can see here the mesh. We can also for example take a look inside the mesh using the mesh clip filter which will clip our mesh And then, for example, apply. It can take some time, so it's very computing intensive, but when it's done we get a really nice insight into our mesh and then you will also understand why this automatic meshing is so powerful. Um, maybe just, just one thing which is very important when we're talking about meshing. Uh, when your mesh is finished you can have a lock here. And as long as these messages are not read everything is fine and if it's everything is green it's even perfect. Okay now we have cut our mesh. Let's now oh wrong direction and now we can take a look inside. So here for example you can see the layers which are looking quite good. They're following the whole surface even in edges and corners and as I mentioned the mesh is automatically refined in the near of walls. And now we can start to actually set up our simulation. For this we will switch to simulation designer, click on the new simulation button and then as you know First of all, we have to define which kind of simulation we want to, to perform. And we want to do a fluid dynamic simulation for natural heat transfer. And we will do a laminar, we will use a laminar turbulence model because we don't expect turbulence uh, for, for this natural con convection. And we will do a steady state simulation. Okay, now click on save and everything you need, this whole project tree will be added here. We should just have to follow and it will guide you to the final simulation. First of all, we have to define which mesh we want to use. We will just use the same mesh we created, mesh 1. Now it's added. And after a few seconds, you can see the mesh here. We can for sure change the kind of representation to surfaces only. And now let's start. And first of all, this is quite similar to, to a, a structured simulation. We have to define which kind of material model we want to use. 
And for this, click on the material item in the project tree, click on this add fluid material button. And then you can here define a fluid by some, some material parameters like molecular weight, viscosity, etc. But and right now you could theoretically for I would say every fluid in the world, especially for, for, for industrial fluids, you will get a kind of, 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 of fact sheet and you can just get all this information there. But we also have for sure a very nice material library which includes all materials uh, properties for the most common fluids, for example in our case air. Click on save, then everything is automatically updated, even the name, and then you just have to assign it to the fluid zone. Click on save, and now this element becomes green. Okay, and now we come to something which is uh, a little bit more complex to understand. Um, okay, let's try it like this. You see we have initial conditions and boundary conditions. And in the last sessions we just ignored the initial conditions because they were not important for us. Here they are important. And just for you to understand what initial conditions basically are, let's, tr let's try me to give you an, a very easy example. Okay. Um, you maybe ask yourself how exactly these this tools are calculating the flow, how the simulation is done from the mathematical point of view. And in the end, there are equations which are very old, like 250 years old. Most important is Navy, the so-called Navier-Stokes equation, which are describing the motion of the fluid completely with a, a momentum, a mass and the energy, um, uh, energy which is, is checked. Now, the big problem is in theory this equation, you could take this equation theory and solve any problem analytically. But unfortunately, the equations we are using for simulation are not uh, analytically solvable. You can only solve them numerically. And now I think it's at some point. In the end, we're using an iterative approach for, for this. So, um, it's not like calculated directly, but it's calculated step by step. And in the end, the initial conditions are used as starting solution for calculation. calculation. As I mentioned, you should keep in mind that simulation results can only be uh, approximately only. And in the end, the applied numerical method operates in a loop. It takes the latest result and uses it as an input for the next result. And therefore, we need any kind of start values, initial values, and this is what we're defining here. And most of cases, you don't have to touch them. Because the idea is that you only need initial solution, which can be very wrong, but it should not be too wrong. As long as it's, let's say, um, not too bad, even if you, like here, assume a pressure distribution, uniform pressure distribution of, of one bar inside the whole whole domain and a, a uniform temperature of, of 293 Kelvin, it's definitely not our result, it's wrong. But it's uh, true enough to be a good initial solution. And the only two things we modify today is, first of all, the velocity because we know that the velocity will be mainly flow in this direction, y direction, so let's just take a very small value and this will improve the uh, convergence of a simulation and we have to um, enter the dynamic viscosity ourselves because zero would not be a good starting value. Yes, and now initial conditions are done. For sure if you would have more information about the flow field. You could even use a non-uniform uh, initial condition, but for our case this is really fine. In contrast to this, the boundary conditions, they are not used for every simulation step and they are describing how your model is interacting with, with, uh, with its environment. And we can add new boundary conditions by clicking this add boundary condition button. 
And now let's just start to create boundary conditions. Then let's start with the site inlet, which is here, with this three surfaces. And call it site inlet. And this is what kind of boundary condition do we need here? And for this, you just ask yourself, what do I know and what do I want to, to, to uh, learn from the simulation? And a good example here is, actually, we don't know if in which direction flow is entering or leaving. We just think that main part of the flow must enter the domain here. And main part of the flow, which is flowing through this slot, will leave the domain and therefore we will use a custom boundary condition because what we know is that for velocity we don't know anything we just and for this a special kind of boundary condition pressure inlet velocity which is calculating the velocity here based on the pressure difference on the left and the right side about the pressure we know a little bit more because we know the environment pressure and the environment gamma, which is the ratio between uh, different uh, kinds of pressures. You know we have static and dynamic pressure, etc. And what we also know is that the temperature here should be environment temperature. So we can use fixed value for temperature and the same for the viscosity, which is fixed. And now we just have to assign it. I've already selected this face it at lecture viewer and it's done. Now we have to create something similar for this top inlet outlet. So let's call it top inlet outlet. And again we need a custom boundary condition here. And again, we don't know the velocity, but in this case, we will use pressure inlet outlet velocity. Um, the reason is that we here really are not sure what is happening. It can also be a big backflow. And um, also, we don't know pressure temperature distribution here. Therefore, we have to use pressure inlet outlet velocity instead of pressure inlet velocity. Pressure, we don't know, so uh, for sure we know it's again total pressure. What we don't know is the temperature, so we'll put gradient to zero, which means I know that I don't know the value and I know that it's a static value, but and now we have just to select again these top faces. Add selection from viewer, and here we go. Next, we need a boundary condition for the different parts we have here. So let's start. Take a look from below. And here you can see the chips, for example. So let's start with this chip here. And we can also take a look inside if you want by hiding the surfaces. So and then let's start with this chip here and call it chip 2. Here we don't need to use a custom boundary condition. It's just simply a wall. It's a no-slip wall because we have no slips here. <laughs> And, and that's important, now we can define the temperature here. And if we take a look back at our presentation, you can see the temperatures here. And this chip one, which is the bigger one, has a temperature of about 321 Kelvin. So let's go back 
enter the temperature here, add selection from viewer, and we do the same for, oh, sorry, this was chip 1, not chip 2, no big deal. And then do the same here, chip 1, wall, And then, sorry, let's go first of all, here, you can call it chip to, no, we have to select the faces here. Sorry, very important. If you save, the selection will get lost. So first add selection before you save it. Save. And by the way, here, chip one, I just forget some of the faces. So this one, the side faces of the chip, which are also important. We now take a look at the whole selection. Everything is selected. Great. Now two boundary conditions are missing. First of all, we will apply a general temperature to the board. For this, I will show everything, clear my selection, and select the spot here only. Add the new boundary condition. Board. Wall. It's 289 Kelvin and the final boundary condition is for all the remaining surfaces for the housing itself so I will do the same trick I did during the meshing I will first of all select all faces which already have a boundary condition like the chip the board and the inlet and outlet surfaces. Same here. And then we can just invert our selection. Selection from viewer. And now we finish some boundary conditions. Finally, we have to adapt some numerical settings. As, <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, this is based on uh, a numerical approach, so we therefore have to adapt these values to make the simulation more stable. This is not affecting the setup of the simulation, but how it's calculated, and so this settings, for example, as lower as they are, they make the simulation more stable, but slower. And since it's a little bit more complex simulation, I will use smaller factors. So I, one would be um, like uh, no influence, and smaller than one means more stable, and bigger than one, faster simulation. We will use a moment predictor, that's great. And the only thing we have to modify here are the solvers we want to use. And the rest you can just keep it like it is. And now we have to add our simulation control. We want to do 2000 iterations. We only want to save the final result. We want to use 16 cores and have a maximum runtime of 16,000 seconds. And now what you can do is check the simulation 
Oh, and here you get a warning, some faces are missing a boundary condition assignment. And let's just take a look what could missing could be missing. And for this, the easiest is just to, another good trick, select the assignment and hide it. And if you do this, you will see which faces have no boundary condition. And huh, I forgot to create a new boundary condition for the walls, but don't worry. Again, we can use this. Um, wait. What we can do right now is just to hide selection, hide the selection. And now we have only. And now what we will do is we will select all, remove this board, oh, wait. And now we will hide also the board. Clear this boundary condition first. Create a new one. Call it walls. Now we can add the selection. Just type wall. And we don't know the temperature. The temperature will be set gradient to zero. And here we just now have to Invert visibility, we can directly choose edit, and now it's solved. Sorry for the confusion, guys. Uh, but this, I think, showed you how to solve such an error warning. So check simulation. Now everything is successful. We can create a run and start the simulation. Okay, then, guys, you wrote so many questions. Um, let's... Um, Answer them in one minute. Okay, let's just do a quick wrap up. So, I showed you general um, CFD analysis types, how to create a simulation. We assigned the mesh, defined materials, and talked a lot about initial and boundary conditions. Um, advanced topic C would be numerical solver settings and advanced solver control. These are two things which I just showed you what to do, but not really well able to explain you why you have to do it. And this is very hard really to understand because it has to do a lot with math and high level physics. But if you're interested in this, check out our documentation and you will get all your questions answered. And now, after some time, when our simulation is, is finished, um, we can take a look at the results. First of all, I would like to answer some questions. First, David asked why we didn't use the thermostructure analyzers. And the reason is we were interested in the heat distribution within the fluid domain. And therefore, it's, not, uh, it's a fluid, we need to do a CFD analyzers. Theoretically, we could, but we could couple both, do a thermostructure and a, a, a fluid flow analysis, and then couple both simulations to get best results. David, does it answer your question? If not, please just let me know. Next question is by Ken. Um, he wants to know where have you put the initial speed? Ken, that's a good question, and to make it, um, to be honest. This value is just uh, well, it's just my experience. I'm doing simulation more than 10 years, 
And as I mentioned, initial conditions are important because if they are too much away from the final result, your simulation will uh, interrupt. And I just thought, well, if it works like I think, the main flow direction must be in y direction. And I zero and I test a little bit, and 0 0.1 meter was working good. Um, Ken also wants to know what is that gamma. Maybe you should take a look at it. Um, as you know, there are different kind of pressures. When we're talking about pressure, a lot of people think there's only one pressure, but we have a static pressure and the dynamic pressure. And just and a total pressure. This total pressure is the sum of dynamic, static, and height pressure. And gamma shows you, it's like giving you how the ratio is between these different pressures. So a total pressure and gamma is enough to calculate all other pressures out of it. Um, and Ken also wants to know if we can define a power. Um, yes, yeah, another kind of boundary conditions. You can also use heat flux boundary condition instead of a fixed temperature as Axel asked. And you can also define power. Just give it a try. Um, for example, wall heat transfer allows you to specify um, flux. Okay, and yes, um, come back to your questions. The gamma. This gamma I used 1.4 is the gamma that I assume for the environment flow. So that's, that's the reason why I only use it for inlet and outlet. And 1.4 would be the right value for 20 degrees. Uh, yes. And, and still when the wind is not moving. But you're right. Basically, your gamma is changing in, inside the flow field. But I only define gamma for the inlet and the outlet phases and not for inside the inside volume. Okay, guys, if you have more questions, just ask them. We have also a, a, a question and answer session just after um, the presentation. And now I would like to do some post-processing with you. For this, I've prepared a simulation, which is already finished. You can see that, by the way, is the average error. For every iteration, you can see it becomes smaller and smaller. And the final error, for example, for, for pressure is uh, smaller than 0 0.0016. Um, Alex wrote that audio was lost. Was it the same for you or only for Alex? Maybe you can just write it in the chat on the question if your audio was also lost for you. OK, Alex, no idea. Seems to be only for Alex. Um, the, okay, Alex, would it be okay for you, since we're a little bit of time pressure, if you could just check up the section in the recording, which I will update today? Okay, great. Thanks, Alex. Yes, and this shows us, first of all, the simulation worked. And this is the error we had with our initial conditions. And so for this next, for the next iteration, he used the result as an input. And that's the reason why in the... In theory, our simulation results should become better and better for every iteration. Now let's switch to the post-processor. And if some of you are a little bit longer uh, users of SimScale, you may recognize that our post-processor has changed. We have a complete brand new post-processor since, uh, uh, since the beginning of the month, I think. And first of all, I will now take a look at the 3D simulation results. So click on the solution fields item. And this will now open the 3D results. And here they are. So here you can see now it's the loading. You can see now the flow domain. And first of all, to give you a small introduction, this, you have several objects here. And this object is so the whole simulation. You can apply no filters to extract parts of the simulation. And you will maybe your first question is if we put turn on the color legend, 
clicking on this button, it seems like the pressure is everywhere the same, which makes no sense. But if you take a look at the numbers, this is exactly the pressure we defined during our initial con uh, uh, conditions. And here it's time step zero. So here we can take now a look at the, these are the initial conditions. If we would, for example, add a filter and make a slice. So, you know, as you know, you can define a slice by our origin and the normal. And now we will put a slice and extract only the slice out of this model. And now you can see it here. And if you would now take a look at the velocity, it's updating now. Uh, then you will see that the velocity has everywhere the same value. 0 0.1 meters per second. These are our initial conditions. And even to make it here, you can see y component is still 0 0.1. But if you would change it to x component, it would be 0, like here. And um, then let's switch back to magnitude. And now let's switch from the initial condition with just the iteration zero to our final result, which is, click to the last frame, which is 2000. And now, yeah, <coughs> sorry, this is our result. And let me just also visualize again, it was automatically uh, uh, hidden the whole mesh. change representation to and then we can make a opacity to it this can again take some seconds And now we can take a look side, look inside. So now we can for sure move the slice also. And here we can, for example, just define an offset in x direction, let's say one centimeter. And then we can take a look inside, for example. And we can now take a look on whatever we are interested in, like velocity, but also we could take a look at temperature. that sometimes needs to update. And we can, this is just an example for one filter, so you can see the temperature distribution. And we can even apply a lot of other filters, so let me remove the slice, hide it. That's a very important, if you want to apply now the next filter, Please select before in this tree the simulation one, otherwise you will apply the filter on the slice. Now we will add a filter and create this streamlines. Then we have streamlines. For sure we can also change the color representation for streamlines. And we can also make some longer, short, or more streamlines, less streamlines, and even can access some, let's say, high-end parameters, how to how they are calculated. Okay, guys. So, for example, now I just 
show you the streamlines and if you want to make them for example uh, more maximum you can change longer you can change the maximum length to two meters Okay, great. I think that was the first introduction and I really suggest guys play around with the tools, try what you want to try and please share your insight without in the forum. Okay, then I think we are nearly done. I showed you how to change a time step, how to hide and show objects and how to create slides and streamlines. And if you are interested in more post-processing, I really suggest you to try to, to just test yourself the capabilities of our online post processor and if you want to do really let's say automated high-end post processing we can also recommend to use the offline version of our post processor which is very similar to Paraview. Okay guys now um, first of all thank you very much for your attention and right now before we have we'll start to talk about uh, your questions I would just like to present your homework assignment to you. And um, this week, uh, we want to put you into the seat of a, of a, let's say, HVAC engineer or of an electronic device engineer. And the aim of this exercise is that you guys should investigate two different cooling concepts for a Raspberry Pi housing. Uh, the two variants differ in, in terms of their underlying heat transfer mechanism. We have on the left side the passive version, which we already simulated, where we have no fan, where we have only natural convection, and which is, is, is has a kind of passive cooling. And on the right side, we have uh, a design where we have uh, uh, forced convection and a fan, which is forcing the flow to stream through this case. And you have to, in the end, what you have to do is to mesh both geometries. It's exactly the same procedure and then to set up two simulations, which are very equal. The setup is quite equal for both. On simsky.com slash um, make is for sure the wrong link. On simsky.com you will um, find, uh, yes, again, step-by-step -step instructions, uh, which you can use to set up the simulation yourself. And um, just, I don't want to confuse you, therefore, within this homework, uh, you will use a so-called fan curve. You don't, in the end, you don't have to understand it. You will just use it as an input. But maybe because some of you are interested, this fan curve in the end is just um, used to um, characterize a fan and it shows the dependence on flow uh, and pressure increase. So the idea is I have a volume flow here, pressure here, and I just see how was my pressure changing with my flow and then I have different curves and these curves can be used for boundary condition if we want to model a fan what you have to do in the homework. Guys great thank you very much for your time now I'm really looking forward to your question and answers um, let's start and first question is by uh, sorry guys one second and the first question is by um, Jenny. He wants to know which software we use for inverting shell cat models to solid. Um, here you had two shells. One was housing, another was electronics. Which software did you use to get model of air? Hey, um, we are using different cat tools on site ourselves to prepare our models. Mainly on shape, which is a, a, a free cat based, uh, free cloud based cat tool. But in the end, every Cat tool can 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 help can extract this. You just have to do a boolean operation. So in the worst case, you have to create a kind of block around both, which is uh, including electronics and housing, and then you subtract um, this the case from the block, the electronics from the block, and then you get it. Um, yes. Then. Oscar wants to know when we change the pressure solver from PCG to GAMG. Yes, um, Oscar, that's a good question. And as I mentioned in general, 
um, or the general processes that um, we are transferring this diff with meshing, we are transferring this very complex differential equations into a linear equation system, and there are different kind of algorithms to use it, to solve it. And uh, for um, simulations like uh, where we have uh, natural convection, like here, from our experience, GAMG is much performing much better than uh, PCG or smooth solvers. Uh, this is um, maybe not a question of taste, but this is my experience. The correct, uh, uh, if you want to explain it correctly, uh, you have to take a look at the result uh, of, of the structure of your matrix you later have on. And uh, for different structures of metrics, so where, for example, you have zeros in the matrix, you use different kind of um, solvers. And okay, Fritz has two questions. Uh, uh, how to simulate multi-phase flow? <laughs> okay, Fritz. First of all, right now we support multi-phase in our platform, so we have. I can show it to you quickly. Uh, if you would create a new simulation, fluid dynamics, multi-phase, uh, and we have some examples. For example, we have uh, free surface flow. Uh, we have even a simulation of a, a, a boat, and we have even sloshing in a tank. And if you're interested in this, we will uh, for sure soon have a workshop about this. And I would suggest you just to check our project library, go on the public projects. If you now just look, and you can, independent from what you're looking for, just enter here, multi-phase. And then, in some seconds, what they show it to you. Wait, sorry. Here, and then you have an overview of all our project, public projects, uh, which are about multi-phase. Okay, guys. Then, thank you very much for your time. It was a big pleasure. Is there or no? questions anymore. I just can say thank you very much on behalf of the whole SimScale team. It was a big pleasure to work with you. I'm really looking home forward to your homework submissions. A lot of people are I've already submitted the first and second homework. And um, yes, it was great fun for me. And if you have any feedback, please share it with us. If you have problems, use the forum. And we would love, or I would love to see you in the future as active members in our community. Uh, have a nice weekend, guys. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, let's keep in touch. Maybe you can join soon our next very interesting workshop series. Bye.